Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming on a what turned out to be rather snowy Saturday morning, but you're glad all of you all here. And most importantly, we're glad to have uh, the panelists here to discuss what has become an extremely interesting issue, particularly in applied originalism. Uh, one of the revolutionary changes in the last decade or so has been the, develop the application of originalist principles to criminal law and particularly criminal procedure. Uh, Professor Bebas and I were privileged enough to actually be clerking for the court when the it began embarking on this enterprise, which is in a case called Almendar's Torres, where they began to explore what the originalist implications are. And it's created an interesting debate uh, that has really uh, moved <coughs> originalism from extremely abstract issues into a very concrete application to figure out how these principles played out. And we are privileged to have two of the leading experts on this field to discuss with us today. Uh, our first speaker will be Professor Jeff Fisher of Stanford Law School. Uh, the rest of his bio is in your, in your uh, program. But among the other things, he co-directs the Supreme Court Litigation Clinic. He will speak first. And then uh, Professor Stephanos Bibas, who is a professor of law here at Penn, who is also a director of a Supreme Court Clinic here. And perhaps they'll end up crossing swords in more than one form. <laughs> professor Fisher. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be invited to be part of this uh, conference and, and, and this panel with, with, uh, with my colleagues. There, you have a lot of fabulous people here, and I'm privileged to be included among them. And it, it's also the first time I've been to Penn, so it's a double privilege uh, to be here today. Although having said all that, uh, I will say that having flown in from the West Coast last night uh, and then getting put on the 9 a.m. panel East Coast time, uh, I think maybe you're trying to take advantage, and then you, <laughs> and then you make me walk here in the snow. Uh, but um, but I appreciate again the the, the opportunity to be here. Um, I, I was looking through the materials and I, I saw unfortunately I wasn't able to be here, but a panel last night involved uh, whether originalism is a rationalization for conservatism or rather is a privileged uh, a principled theory of interpretation, and I think that's a wonderful place to begin framing the debate that we're going to have today. Because, uh, because I'm sure as you discussed last night, oftentimes originalism is thought as a, or at least criticized as a way to, uh, to simply get to conservative results. Uh, and you can look at certain cases where indeed the court does divide uh, among liberal conservative lines uh, where originalism is on the conservative side of the case. Uh, Heller might be an exam uh, a particularly prominent recent example of that. Uh, but when you turn to criminal procedure, things are not so simple. Uh, we're going to talk particularly about <coughs> two lines of cases today. Uh, the first, uh, the one that Professor Yu mentioned involving the, the, the Supreme Court's reinvigoration of the right, Sixth Amendment right to jury trial, and second, the Supreme Court's re recent reinvigoration of the Sixth Amendment right to confrontation. Um, in both of these areas, the court has divided sharply. Um, but what's interesting is in both of these areas, they've divided sharply across ideological lines. Uh, so in both of the lines of the cases we're going to be discussing, the court has proceeded primarily uh, with a five-member majority. Uh, Justice Scalia, Justice Thomas, and then Justice Stevens, Justice Ginsburg, and Justice Souter. Um, on the other hand, uh, you've had, uh, at least initially, you had Chief Justice Rehnquist and Sandra Day O'Connor uh, and Justice Kennedy in the dissent, along with Justice Breyer, and now uh, Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Alito have stepped seemingly uh, quite uh, naturally into the shoes in this debate of Chief Justice Rehnquist and, uh, and Justice O'Connor. In fact, uh, I'm going to speak a little bit autobiographically at points today because I've been involved in many of these cases. Uh, but as somebody who uh, represented defendants in these cases, and uh, d given that criminal defense work is often associated with, with perhaps a liberal point of view or, uh, or the like, uh, when President Bush uh, had two vacancies on the Supreme Court and said, uh, I'm going to appoint people in the mold of Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas, uh, I was perhaps one of the only people with these kinds of cases that was saying, fantastic, uh, that'll be great, I'll pick up two votes. Uh, but as it happened, uh, he, at least in, if you measure this area of law, uh, President Bush gave us people much more in the mold of Chief Justice Rehnquist, uh, which has not turned out so well for me so far uh, in terms of picking up votes. 
Uh, but again, uh, the reason that I think this is a great, great conversation to have uh, is because it forces you to think. It forces everybody to think about what originalism really means, uh, about what, uh, uh, what constitutional jurisprudence uh, really should be about. Uh, so let me turn first to the right to jury trial, uh, and I'll outline each of these areas a little bit and then say a few words about them. Uh, so as Professor Yu mentioned, this, this debate about the right to jury trial has been going on now for a little bit more than a decade. Um, it arose uh, primarily uh, because of uh, a rather modern innovation by uh, legislatures and Congress. Uh, what they did is they stepped in starting in the 1980s, and rather than uh, when they wanted to criminalize a new act or increase the punishment for a new act, uh, simply uh, enacting a new crime or enacting a, uh, an aggravated version of a crime, they stepped in and started to designate what they called sentencing factors. Uh, and a sentencing factor would be a particular fact that the legislature uh, identified as aggravating the, the crime uh, and that would increase, subject the defendant at least to it, a, an increased sentence, often severely increased sentence. Um, and, but instead of uh, the traditional mode of, of letting, the, uh, letting that issue be charged in the indictment and proved beyond a reasonable doubt to the jury, they left it to the judge to find after, uh, after the defendant was convicted of the base crime uh, to find this fact by preponderance of the evidence and to increase the defendant's sentence if the, if the judge uh, decided that was appropriate. So the first time that the court really applied this as a constitutional matter was a case called Apprendi versus New Jersey in 2000. In that case, the state of New Jersey had made assault uh, a crime punishable by 10 years in prison, uh, but the legislature had stepped in and said, but if the defendant picked his victim on the basis of racial animus, then a, a five-year increase in the sentence is permissible. Uh, so that's what happened, that's the, the, what Mr. Apprendi was charged with, and then after he was convicted of assault, and after trial, the judge decided that he had indeed picked his victim based on racial animus and increased his sentence to 12 years. And the five-member majority that I spoke of earlier uh, held that that violated the Sixth Amendment right to jury trial. Uh, now, as I see it, and profess, it may be that uh, Professor Bebus wants to take me on on this, um, but I, as I see it, I think Apprendi was actually a fairly easy case. Uh, if you care really at all about the history and tradition of the Sixth Amendment right to jury trial. Uh, because there, uh, you had just a classic case, in my view, of, of, of an aggravated crime. Uh, imagine, uh, think of just everyday examples of the difference between armed robbery and robbery, the difference between murder and manslaughter. Uh, they all include an extra element or an extra fact uh, that makes the crime worse. And we've always assumed that the jury would find that fact. And the reason why we've assumed the jury would find that fact is not necessarily because the jury is a better fact finder, a more accurate fact finder than the judge. Um, but when you look at the history of the Sixth Amendment right to jury trial, what you'll find is the reason the jury had to find these facts, or at least they had to be proved uh, to the jury, was so that the jury could engage in what I think is most accurately described, even though the Supreme Court has, has shied away from this term, but is most accurately described as a limited nullification right of the jury. Uh, at the time of the founding, most, uh, most felonies were punishable by death. Um, and the juries knew that. Uh, and they knew uh, if they convicted defendants of certain crimes, they'd subject them to death penalty. Uh, but what juries traditionally had the power to do, and, and indeed often did, was return verdicts on lesser offenses uh, when they thought that the crime or the defendant's acts were not severe enough to trigger the death penalty. So the jury was an institution of public conscious, uh, consciousness that was interposed between the prosecution and the judge. In other, in other words, between uh, the state and the state. It was the citizen's ability to, to have uh, what the Supreme Court later called a check on the judiciary. And that has hold, held true throughout, uh, really throughout criminal jurisprudence leading up to today. Uh, and that is why I think Apprendi was an easy case and the Supreme Court properly said, hey, if this fact subjects the defendant to extra punishment, uh, then it ought to be proved to the jury. 